Mama Cat. George. Hello, my fellow sniffers. My name is Marlene McCohen, and this is Cody, my African Gray. Cody, do you want to do anything special? Like maybe jump on my head for this video? Oh, okay. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> Today, my sniffers, is the video you guys have been waiting for. Now, although I'd love to welcome you to Storytime Sunday, I'm pretty sure today is going to be Tuesday while this video comes out. But today is actually Monday the 28th, and I'm gonna get to why that's very important for you guys in one second. I just wanna say that in light of Hurricane Harvey, a lot of you who are on my Parrot Station page on Facebook, you know that I wasn't able to get a video out because my family lives in Houston. So today's Storytime Sunday is going to replace Parrot Tip Tuesday until I can get back on schedule. If you guys have been watching consistently, you know that this week is the big secret story of Cody. I want you all to sit back, relax, pause this video, grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, because I know this video is going to be a long one. It's going to be a mystical one and a little bit unbelievable. So like I said last week, this is a story for believers only. So welcome to the very big secret story of Cody, my African Grey. Now, although today is not Sunday, it's a very important day. As I mentioned, it's August 28th. August 28th is the day that my African Grey, George, died three years ago today. Actually, in the background here, I have this big blanket with George's photo on it. So what better day to tell you this story than the anniversary of his death? Guys, I don't even know really. <laughs> Did you just bump my head and laugh? I swear I think he's here just to give me some comedic relief because although I love telling this story, I feel like today it's gonna be particularly hard to tell. So I'm kind of happy that he's hanging out on my head. It feels so weird to be telling this story on YouTube. So I'm just gonna tell you guys everything that I tell everybody else when they get really interested in this story and I'm not going to leave anything out. Now keep in mind there are going to be parts that are kind of unbelievable and may or may not pertain to you and that's okay. This is just a story. You can believe some parts and not believe others. You can find meaning in some parts like I did and no meaning in other parts. That's completely okay. I just want to tell you the way I tell everyone else. So here it goes. About three years and a few months ago, my sister and I started having some dreams. Now, if you guys know my father, he's been a guest star on this channel before, you know that I'm obsessed with him and so is pretty much everyone else in my family. We really, really love my dad. I should tell you that um, I have a history of being an extremely psychic child. I've always been like that. Everyone in my family comes to me for guidance and readings and predictions and things like that. So sometimes when I have certain dreams, they do come true. And other times when I have certain dreams, they may just be based out of a fear. But either way, it's scary for me because I'm always scared that things are going to come true. Now, I do believe, of course, that if you sit and analyze your dreams, you'll find out that a lot of it is accumulation of what happened during the day or things you thought about or TV shows. So I do sit and analyze it and know which dreams kind of are going to come true and mean something and which dreams don't. Anyway, my sister in particular, she doesn't really have a history of dreams coming true, but she's still young, so you know, you just don't know. My sister and I both started having dreams that my father was going to die. This made us extremely paranoid, extremely worried. I kid you not, once a week we would call my mom and get her all worried because my mom's also very obsessed with my dad and just like it would create like a whole worry throughout the entire house and we would sit and analyze what does it mean did it come from anything during the day did we watch something and this would happen over and over and over again and it was just extremely disturbing to us now in terms of the big picture of life we didn't really think so much of it i mean you have a dream you kind of go on with the day after you discuss it with everybody and talk about your fears and 
you know, mom would put me on with dad. She'd be like, he's fine. He's doing really great. Here, speak to him for yourself. And I'd be like, dad, what are you eating? Make sure you're eating all vegan, all healthy. Dad, I could tell that you ate that cookie today. What are you doing? You know, dad would go, bye-bye, I'm okay. Everything is very good. Don't you be worrying. Fast forward to, I'm going to New York City. And before I leave, I do this whole thing with my bird, George, where I tell him how many days I'm going to be gone for. If you guys watch my time for technique, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But Cody, let me borrow you for a second. I left him on the side because he can get very distracting. So before I would leave, because he understands what time for means, I would say one time for bed, two time for bed, three time for bed, and I would count them all out just to make sure that the bird would understand how long I'm gonna be gone for. At the end of the amount of time for beds, I would say, mommy's home. My logic in this was that the bird knows what time for bed means. He understands counting because George understood counting and he understood mommy's home. These were all things I would say. So I'd been gone for much longer periods before and everything was really fine and George was a very, emotionally stable African gray. Like I just knew that about him. He was extremely healthy, extremely emotionally stable. It was just an amazing, really, really brilliant bird. I go to New York and um, I'm there for the first event and the second event. And then one day I get this like real feeling about my bird and I'm really excited about him and I post something on Facebook, how lucky I am in life to have like a pet like this. And I post this video of George, which I will post for you guys tonight. And you know, sometimes I have this superstition that if you're really proud of something, maybe don't post it, maybe don't share it with the world because there's jealousies and superstitions and maybe you should keep the good things for yourself. But really like we're talking about my Facebook friends and my bird and I was just really excited. The next day I get a call and by the way, I'd been FaceTiming my bird every single day and he loved it. He would totally come on the phone and you would see him talking to me and we'd be FaceTiming. And the next day I was told that George was very quiet. And I said, put him on FaceTime with me. And they're like, he hasn't really talked all day. And they're like, but I think he's fine. I'm like, no, 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 that's not a good sign at all. And then I'm like, he looks like he's eating and drinking really slow. Please like take care of him. Like, and I gave specific instructions, which we really won't go into. And the bird looked like he was doing so much better. I got like this picture of him. Like you could tell he was like sick, but his eyes were full of life. And I probably told you guys this in the story about grief, so I don't need to go into so many details, but long story short, he got really sick. And after this one vet visit where I don't think they did right by my bird, he um, had a seizure right after. And I'm telling you like the picture before he went into the vet, like he had hope and life in his eyes and the picture after just, he did not really look so good at all. And I just knew. So I did this whole thing um, that day before he went to the vet where I sometimes get in touch with some magical stuff and lit these candles to find out what was gonna happen and like to send positive energy. As soon as I lit the candle, I felt like my bird was going to die because what I read from it was that he was going to the heavens. Anyway, um, the night before when I knew he was sick and I was really, really worried about it, I had seen something in the room of my aunt's house that I had only seen one time before in my life and I knew it wasn't a good sign. It was like a square, a black square like floating in the room. I didn't know what it was, but the last time I had seen it, it wasn't that disaster happened, it was that there was a warning. And um, let me tell you the story about the last time I saw it. One day I was sleeping in my apartment about eight years ago. I'm one of those serious Leo sleepers. My phone is on silent mode. It doesn't matter what is about to happen. I can't sleep with my phone on and the beeping and whatever and emergencies and like my phone is on silent mode every single time I wake up late. I'm just one of those people. In the middle of the night, I woke up because I kept having nightmares that someone was trying to get into the apartment. 
I woke up George and I said, you like need to get up and figure out who's trying to get into the apartment. There's a burglar outside, something is out there. He walks to the hallway and all the lights are on and he basically says something which indicates that I'm probably just worried because the lights are on. It's not a big place. So you could tell right there that nobody's in the house. Like it's pretty obvious. But when he was gone, that black thing appeared. You laughing? That black thing appeared between the bed and the door. And I'm sitting on the bed and I see this black thing and I'm looking at it and it's waving and it's not like shaped like anything tangible. It's not like a ghost. It's not like, it's just like black air and it's like, like a square really. And my thought process was there's no way he can cross the door to the bed because that thing is in the way. So I think quickly, I'm not gonna be like, oh, there's a big black entity blocking the door. So uh, you probably can't get in. I think quickly and I say, uh, go check the back door. He goes to the back door and I hear bang, 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 bang. And I hear, what are you doing? Oh my God, are you crazy? And I'm like, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And what happened was I had this young kid staying with me, 17 years old, came out to LA to wanna be an actor. Very like, would misplace things all the time, lose things, like had no thought process. This kid, essentially lost the keys to the place or forgot them and tried to get in the back door. But he was sleeping. He had already been sleeping on the balcony for a few hours, proven by the text that I had got from him a few hours prior saying, are you awake? Can you come to the back door? So when George went to the back, he saw his feet on the ground lying there. This is important because this is evidence that I wasn't hearing him right then and there that woke me up. It had already been hours since he was trying. He was out there freezing and the entity wouldn't let George cross back to me until we figured out that he was outside. So those kind of things have happened to me since I was a kid. That specifically only that time. When I was praying for George and trying to heal him from afar, that thing appeared to me and I kind of knew that, you know, it was, you know, probably there to let me know that I don't know how these things work, that it was going to take George or uh, I, I don't know. Sometimes I believe with me specifically, although I'm very hypersensitive and by the way, I believe everybody can do this. I just believe that I'm in tune because I'm extremely sensitive two animals, two things. I'm looking at Cody as like two pink lips on his feathers now. So I don't know exactly what everything was for, but I knew something was gonna happen to my bird and I was very upset about it. When I found out I was in the middle of New York City, I was just devastated. I think I told you guys before, it felt like the whole city around me stopped. You watching me? Fast forward to a few days later, I can't go home. It's the wedding now or, or it's the bar mitzvah. And now I know my entire family is going to be coming from all over. Like my California family's coming. My Texas family is coming. We're all going to be there now in New York City, New Jersey for this wedding. But before that, I felt like if I could just ask my dad why this happened. It didn't make sense to me. Like George was only eight years old. It made no sense. So I felt like, just like my dad had the answer. I don't know why, like obviously it's not like my dad could say this is why it happened. But I knew that if I would ask him, he had the answer. Something didn't make sense. Especially since I've always been a hypersensitive kid, especially since I've had this bird since he was a baby. So it just felt like it made no sense. I've had pets die before. This was different. This made no sense to me at all. I had to find out why. Now this is where it gets kind of <laughs> interesting. So I call my dad and I say, dad, you need to tell me why my bird died. And he's like, well, you know, he could have eaten something and he's getting very logical and very practical about it. And I'm like, no, dad, please tell me why. He stops and he realizes this is all over the phone. I think he realizes that I want like more of a mystical answer because it's not making sense. So then he says, well, you know, 
first of all, you shouldn't have named him George because, you know, you're not supposed to name pets and, and the living after the living. Now, this is a Jewish religion belief. We don't have juniors and stuff like that. You don't name people after the living because it has something to do with like the soul and like the soul being taken. I don't want to give you wrong information. Now, before I get all religious on you, this really has nothing to do with religion. None of this, everything I'm about to say, because I mean, half of my family is Catholic. So for me, all religions are important. All religions are correct. It doesn't mean anything except for the fact that the cues I'm getting from this are helping me get answers. So if this would have happened to somebody of any other religion and they felt like some of these dates or correlations correlated to any thing of their religion, I would believe that too. So I just want to let you guys know that so nobody writes anything like weird and religious or whatever. This is really just a story and how I was able to piece things together for myself to feel better about it. So my dad said, you're not supposed to name birds and things after people that are alive. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, my dad's name is George, my bird's name was George. I would never have done that actually, except I told you guys before, it was always my dream to have a bird named George because they're comedians and they're geniuses and from the British magazine, I'd always read about birds named George and I bought my bird with a roommate. She had a crush on a guy and he suggested the name George, so I was fine by that. Yeah, anyhow, that wasn't enough reason for me. That was just like, okay, dad, I get it. I did it too late, now what? He got really serious and he said, well, you know, you never know. You could have made a deal with God. You never know. Maybe somebody else in the family could have died. And you know, animals, they will make a sacrifice to save somebody you love. When he said that, I remembered something that is so interesting because he was the one that has evidence of it. So it wasn't something I didn't say out loud. It was something I told him a few weeks prior before I got on the plane to go to New York. I had had this crazy dream the night before. And while I was waiting for my plane, I called my dad, I'll never forget, in the gift shop to tell him about it. I said, dad, because remember we were having those dreams about him dying. And I remembered one specifically that I had, but thank God for evidence, I had called him and told him about it in the airport on my way to New York. I said, dad, I had this dream that you died. And um, in the dream, I was so devastated that I wanted to change it. Now, something else about me and like something else that the family believes about me is I'm an excellent manifester. Like I could never have any money in my life, but could have every single thing that I want. I've always just been that kind of person like really, really strong beliefs that I can do things and then they do come to fruition. It was like in my dream, I understood that about myself and I went up to a heaven in my dream. I didn't see anything when I was up there. It's like I knew that I went up to anything, whatever you believe in, I went up there and I came down. The next part I remember is when I'm down and I said, I made a deal with God and my dad is going to live his life longer now because of the sacrifice that I made. And I remembered that. I'm like, oh my God, dad, now that you say that, don't you remember that dream that I had? And he goes, you never know, could be. Maybe you did go up and make a deal. And you know, sometimes he said, when the angel of death comes, he said an animal that loves you so much can make a sacrifice and that is of no religion. That is just something that he believed from his deep readings and um, I've read some really amazing Christian books and New Age books and um, Kabbalistic books that all have that same theory. It was really interesting because I'm like wow and then he took the bird with the same name, you know, it's a possibility. And it made me think about the whole thing in a very different way. It made me think, wow, people have family members that die. I know George wasn't just a bird. You guys know how it feels to lose a bird or any pet. It feels like you're losing a child, especially like with a bird that like speaks to you and communicates with you, as we've discussed before. 
But if a human was to die, like my dad or um, any of my family members, that would have been just devastating. So suddenly I was able to look at it from a better point of view, but I was still, of course, extremely devastated. So I started to think if he did make a sacrifice, is something wrong with my dad? So I said, dad, you need to go right now to this natural healer that I had found in Houston, Texas. He's like a cardiologist that got all of his patients off of their meds, off of their drugs, gave them raw vegan food, put them in an exercise boot camp, and he's changing lives. I was like, dad, you have to go to this guy. And my dad's like, okay, I will. You know, like I felt like something was kind of solved in terms of maybe I did really go up and make some sort of deal that I wasn't able to see because I would have been traumatized by it. That was what I thought maybe happened and maybe the bird decided himself it was time for him to do that for me. I don't know. Because my dreams have always been so psychic, I was really hoping that George would come to me in my dreams. And so that's one thing I was waiting for. In the meantime, my family came to New York for the wedding and we were staying at my uncle's house. This is only like literally a few days later after George died. I'm still extremely distraught. Everything makes me upset. And this is my first time seeing Jenna and everyone after the incident. So it was really, really sad for the whole family. While we're at my uncle's house, this guy is outside talking to my father. He's about my father's age. And I go outside, my uncle had invited him over, and I say, hey dad, what's going on? Uh, you know, and my dad goes, Marlin, come here, I want to introduce you, you'll never believe it. This guy was my roommate in college. Not only was this guy my dad's roommate in college, they had both moved from Iran to college in England and they were roommates, they had something in common. They're both kind of like Iranians that are new to England. So not only were they roommates, but now it's what, uh, 30 years later, my uncle in New Jersey ran into this guy's brother. They became friends. After talking, they discovered that both their brothers, my uncle's brother, which is my dad, and this guy's brother, which is the guy that was there, they discovered that they were roommates in college. So they start saying small world. Not long after that, do those two discover that they are cousins, first cousins. So the whole time my dad was in college with this guy and they were best friends, they were also cousins and never knew a thing about it. This guy proceeds to have dinner with us. Now keep in mind, it's only a few days later and it's that day that we met him and I'm very upset about my bird and the guy goes, I have an African gray, a gray bird. I don't know, I think it's an African gray and me and my brother and like my sister are like, really, where? He's like, in my warehouse. For me, I'm away. I haven't like gotten to see a bird in a while. I really need to see a bird. But also the way he told it, like, I don't know anything about the bird. The bird doesn't really hang out. The bird's not really friendly. I said, can we go see him? Now imagine what logic is this that he says, okay. And at eight o'clock at night, he takes an entire family that he hasn't seen in 30 years to his warehouse to see this bird. He wants us to see this bird and really we wanted to go there to show him how to interact with the bird, how to take care of the bird, but it's only been like four days since George died. So I see the bird and I pull the bird out of the cage and he's like, oh my god, I can't believe the bird is so friendly. How did you do that? And I educate him on what food and this and that. I got wind, but nobody really discussed it with me that my dad was like, do you want that bird? I will get him for you. I'm like, okay, like how are you just gonna get this guy's bird? But my dad's thought process, as you guys probably know from the Duffy story, is that he wants to fix my pain and get me a bird, but also he doesn't really like the conditions that that bird is living in without somebody knowing how to be with them, pet him, hold him, anything. So my dad wants to take that bird. The whole time in the car, George and Jenna were like, you know, if you want that bird, we can bring him home. Like, you know, he needs a better home. And I'm just like, throwing tantrum. I don't want like a replacement bird right now. I guess I texted the guy and said, give me updates in case you need any help with your bird. And that was the end of that. I didn't have many dreams about George like I wanted to. I had one dream about George 
And I saw him and I was holding him and I said, oh my God, you're the most genius bird in the world. You figured out how to come back to me. I can't believe it. So I thought George is going to come back to me in another bird. Like he's a genius. This is what's going to happen. But at the same time, I was really devastated, couldn't get over it. And I started kind of being reclusive. So I went to somebody who does body talk. Body talk is kind of like, you know, kind of like the kinetic energy. They talk to your body and they try to heal you and like readjust you or whatever. She doesn't know anything about birds. And she goes into my body, apparently tells her, and she says, there's a dead bird like on your chest. Like it's hard for you to function. And she doesn't know anything about birds. And she goes, your bird was a genius. This bird was a brilliant bird and the ones that come down to this earth that know what they were meant to do, they die first. She also said he knew that you were away and she goes, I don't know if you told him that you're going or how long you're going for, but he knew and he wanted to give you the gift of dying when you weren't around. And I'm like, wow, because I keep saying the time for bed, time for beds for him. That particular day when I said time for bed, I remember I got interrupted and I remember my sister saying, shh, shh, let her finish the time for beds with George. And I always felt guilty. Like maybe he didn't know the exact day from what I was saying. And he expected me on a day and he got depressed. So I always felt guilty about that. But she said he knew and he wanted to die when I wasn't there. And I said, do you believe in anything like, you know, an animal giving a sacrifice or like sacrificing for people? And she said, oh yes, I've seen that many times and that can happen. And I said, my bird hasn't come to me in any dreams. And she said, it's like he's not there. She goes, I don't know what it is, but you know, he's not in that afterlife anymore. And so I kind of got upset, but I was about to get on another plane. I forgot where I was going. And the night before, I remember it was like October 10th, I had this dream that George came back to me again. And I said, oh my God, you're such a genius. You came back to me. And I had this epiphany somewhere before that when George does come back to me, I'm going to name him Garfield. That was my name for him. And I called my mother and I said, mom, I had the dream again that George came back to me. Whenever I fly, I need to have the Reader's Digest. I always fly on the plane with a Reader's Digest. So I get the Reader's Digest and I'm just like flipping through it on the phone with my mom. And I go, do you think that means that he will come back to me and he will be Garfield? And she's like, yeah, possibly. Remember this date? And I flip open. Like I just bought this book and my thumb lands on a page and it's highlighted and it says Garfield. I'm like, mom, oh my God, you'll never believe it. I just opened this book and it says Garfield. And she goes, oh my God, are you serious? And Reader's Digest was doing something where they interview old cartoons to see where are they now and how they feel about things. So that was something very weird that they were doing. And my thumb landed on Garfield as if to give me a sense of Maybe it is true. This is what's going to happen. I had a really hard year missing my bird. I had a very hard time getting over it. And I always felt like a spot was missing. The other birds were always my loves too, but none of them were George. They just didn't give me that excitement to get up in the morning. I mean, of course they do, but it just was different. Like something was severely missing. So since I started believing in the reincarnation of my bird, George, I began to look for the reincarnation. I was convinced that I was going to find George's reincarnation. George was a special bird. He had white toes. The reincarnation of George would obviously have white toes. So since I was convinced that George would have white toes in his reincarnation Garfield, I would go to the bird store that I am close to and I would talk to the guy and see if when the babies are born, he would have any white toed birds. Cause of course it had to be a baby cause it was the reincarnation of George. And I told him all about it and he's like, oh, you'll know, man, you'll know if he, if he's born and you know, sometimes you just know that that's the soul of your old bird. And I was like, great, he's on board. So we're all looking for the white toed bird. I swear every parrot store within like 40 miles of this place, bird conventions, everything 
everyone knew I was looking for a white toed bird. Well, one day Jenna comes to me and she says, I had a dream about George. Jenna had multiple dreams about George. George didn't come to me in my dreams and it would make me really upset because I was like, is he mad at me? Why isn't he coming to let me know? So she said, I had a dream that we had a bird and he didn't have white toes, but he had a red feather on his head. George had a red feather on his tummy. And she said, I looked out the window and I saw you with both the birds and you were with George and the other bird, except that bird had a red feather on his head and George was like, not real, but he was there. It was like his soul was in this other bird. So now I'm like, what do I look for a bird with a red feather on his head? And then finally I was like, you gotta let go and let God handle it. Like, chill out. Like I can't control what kind of bird is gonna come to me. If I control it, it's probably not the way it's going to be. So they told me at the bird store that one in every hundred birds may have white toes. It is of course very special, but specifically year after year, and I'm talking about like two years, they never came across one. He's like, man, this is so rare. Usually I get one, but he didn't get any. In the meantime, my dad had gone to the doctor. He went to that natural doctor that we were talking about and they had found a scar on his heart and they put him on like this raw vegan diet and basically his blood pressure and cholesterol and everything leveled out as soon as he went on this raw vegan diet and for me, it was just like a weird sign because it was like right after I found out that George died, he did listen and he went to this doctor and there was in fact a scar on his heart which indicates that he had a heart attack at some point, a minor one. And now he's completely healing and he's completely fine. So that was very interesting. And then a month later, or maybe a few weeks later, my mom told me, you know, um, August 28th, the day that your bird died, was on that year on the Jewish day of sacrifice, which was so weird because it all came together for me. Again, I say this, but it's not about religion. It could have been a different cue of any religion for anybody else. It was just very interesting for me to piece all of the story together. So I thought, wow, that's very interesting. My grandmother is a really big psychic in Israel. Like she just has a gift. This is a grandmother I didn't grow up with. I didn't know about because um, my father was taken away from her when he was very young. And sure enough, when they came back together, they're very much alike and she's very, very psychic. And when I was in Israel visiting her this past November and I got a chance to be alone with her, I said, can you please tell me about my bird? Like, I know that it's not like the biggest deal in the world in terms of like life problems, but I really want to know about my bird. And she said, the character of your bird, like the soul has gone into another bird that you will have. I said, really? That's so weird. Cause these were kind of my dreams. Like, and then we're trying to guess and George is like, it's Rocky. I'm like, it's not Rocky. He's like, Rocky has white toes. I'm like, it's not Rocky. Like, she goes, no, you'll know. And um, it went into the soul of another bird and that's why you don't dream about it. And I was like, okay. And I was like at peace with that. When I came home to Los Angeles, California, a few days later, I said out loud, I am ready for my African gray now. Was I really ready? In terms of like accepting the situation, yes. In terms of do I need another bird? No, I don't need another bird. We all know I don't need another bird. But for some reason, like only an African gray could fill that void. And in my family, they were like, okay, like just what you need. And I said, I don't know why I'm just ready for my African gray. I'm ready for the reincarnation of George. Like I don't think I was ready before, but I'm ready. The next day I get a call from a number. I have a droid. So it tells me like the last text that I've texted the person while it's ringing in case you don't have their name in. So I see that I texted this person. Oh, well, keep me updated on your bird. And I'm like, I don't know who this is. Like, who did I try to help with their bird? I listen to the message and he's like, hi, Marlene. Uh, I met you in New Jersey and um, 
I want to you to call me back. I need help with my bird. I'm like help with your bird, of course. Like I'm gonna call you back. Da, da, da. I call him back. He goes, uh, I need to tell you something. I moved from New Jersey to Los Angeles. By the way, the same town I live in. Okay, and I brought my bird. And um, I want to know if you want to take him. I'm like, uh, no, because you know I have five birds. That's crazy. Like you know, if you can find a good home, like it would be a better home than mine because I have so many birds. He's like, yeah, well, he's not allowed in the house. He's outside freezing. I'm like, I'll be right there. Cut to the video you guys saw about me rescuing Cody, the bird that I saw three years ago, two and a half years ago, in New Jersey was Cody. Cody? Cody was the bird that I saw four days after George died. Four days after George died. In New Jersey, when a random guy that I didn't really know, that we randomly said, can we go to your warehouse and meet this bird? That this bird didn't really come out for anybody in his family. He didn't even know that birds can be so tame. Came to me and my family. We have a picture of us and Cody like three years ago, of my dad and Cody. My dad couldn't believe it because my dad said, you know what's so funny about this? The fact that not just that this bird now has followed me all the way from New Jersey to California, to the town that I live in. This bird, the bird that I saw four years ago, okay? Not only that, but my dad told me something interesting. He said, you know, that guy that owns the bird, when we were in college, he came into a situation and needed money and I gave him some money to borrow. He never gave it back. My dad doesn't care. My dad is like, whatever someone needs. But he said, imagine that. Like he brought you the bird you wanted, like karma, like 30 years later. So that's why I think that Cody is secretly George, because when Cody came to me, he took to me right away and he kissed me right away. He kisses me all day. He's super attached, like as if I'm going to leave. And he says words that George said, like he's going through all of the same stages that I went through with George since he was a baby. Now, if you do believe in that kind of stuff and you do believe that souls are able to go into other souls because we do have that in our religion well deep deep in the studies that if someone is trying to finish something and they die part of their soul can go into another body and and figure it out if you do believe in that then this is george except what always bothered me is that cody didn't have a red feather on his head like my sister did say about her dream. Well, after I made last week's story time Sunday for you guys and told you about the story that was coming, I was cuddling with Cody and I was scratching his head and giving him a massage. And as I went over his feathers, like you have to really bend all the small ones back, one of the small feathers is red. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, how did I even find that out in time to tell you guys that part of the story? I can't believe it. And by the way, let me tell you what happened with my dad. My dad had been growing out a beard and my mom came to the conclusion. She said, I think you're scaring the children with the beard and you need to shave it because she thought all our dreams were really because he has this beard and he looks older and wiser and it's freaking us out. So my dad ended up shaving his beloved beard of that season and that is pretty much the story of Cody. Whether you're a believer or not, I hope you found this story interesting and I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining in to Storytime Sunday. Today is the anniversary of George's death. So thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe for more lovely bird videos. Follow me on Instagram at Marlene McCohen and have a wonderful, miraculous day. Bye.